Every month, we investigate the ins and outs of relevant topics in the hydrogen sector. Join Hydrogen Europe in this journey to learn more about the green transition as well as hear it directly from its main protagonists, stakeholders and friends. Welcome everybody to this second edition of Hydrogen Europe's podcast, which is called Hydrogen, the first element. And we are delighted to have as our first guest, uh, Giles Dixon, the CEO of Wind Europe. Um, and uh, we are happy to welcome you here in our new studio, our premises. Welcome, Giles. Thank you very much, Jorga. I'm delighted to be here with you. Honored to be your first external guest. Indeed, because um, wind is a prime element also for hydrogen and it was important for us uh, to have you as our first guest also in order to show the relevance of the renewable industries for hydrogen and vice versa but before we start Giles tell us a little bit about yourself so when did you start with Wind Europe seven years ago seven years ago basically I'm six and a half years so we started yeah. somehow together here mm -hmm. in Brussels and um What's what's your connection with wind? Did you serve wind industry before or where do you come from? I, I know you're a diplomat, so I have also served in the foreign office of, of Germany, but you're a real diplomat. I just was a uh, uh, collaborator there. You're a diplomat. And how do you then end up in wind? So I come from Birmingham. Yeah. And I served in the UK government for 16 years, yeah. then left in 2008 and went into industry and worked for seven years to begin with for the French company Alstom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First in Brussels, then in Paris. After seven years, then I joined Wind Europe. That's my story. Oh, so a diplomat who went industry, uh, basically. Yeah. And um, And what's, what's the specificity of, of this wind industry? You saw Alstom. Alstom is not only trains, but mainly trains and other energy energy in, yeah. in general. So what's the specificity? Did you learn? Um, what, what did you take with you from Alstom to Wind Europe? And what, so what helped you? In Alstom, we were working on all forms of electricity production, including coal. Yeah, uh, we were doing a lot of work on carbon capture and storage. So I spent a lot of my time uh, advocating for that. Uh, we did renewables, which was my first exposure to wind. And then it was a transition into working full time on wind. Okay. Do you enjoy? Love it. So it's, it's really, I mean, you only can convince people if you are convinced and uh, everybody who knows you <laughs> can see that here in Brussels and elsewhere we we met both at a cop I think in Poland and yes. Bonn so we met uh, we meet also outside Brussels but you are convinced what makes you convinced about the wind industry wind is clean wind is cheap wind and solar are the cheapest forms of electricity production far cheaper than trying to produce electricity from gas coal or nuclear. Wind is local, so it's good for energy security. We don't have to import uh, our energy. Yeah. Um, great for energy independence. So it ticks all the boxes. Also jobs. Huh? Absolutely. This is, this is something we will discuss maybe yeah. um, uh, at the end of this podcast, uh, how we can create jobs uh, also both uh, together. Indeed. We have 300,000 people working in wind wow. across Europe. Yeah. 300,000. Yeah. With a tendency to grow. It is growing. We hope it will be 450,000 by the end of this decade. Yeah. And those jobs are spread all over Europe. Okay. And they're split between people who are building the wind farms, operating the wind farms. And of course, the wind farms are in rural areas. So these are jobs in rural communities, communities that have often been left behind a bit by globalization. So that is good. And then our manufacturing, we have 250 factories in Europe making wind turbines and components for wind turbines. They're spread all over Europe as well. Can I ask the steel Yeah. But because mainly wind turbines are made out of steel. Steel, concrete, various other concrete, things. Concrete, yeah. but steel is, is very uh, yeah, it is indeed. prominently yes. uh, there. Yeah. Where does it come from, the steel? It comes from all over. A lot of it from Europe. Uh, some we import from outside of Europe. Some we import from China. Of course, we're struggling at the moment with high steel prices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is adding to the costs of making a wind turbine today. I think we we have seen that that uh, indeed um, 
investments into wind at the moment are difficult, more difficult because of the high prices. That's correct. It affects us very much because yeah. hydrogen needs wind. So yeah. that's why I'm asking. So I'm asking in order to understand what's the perspective. So um, is it really, was it COVID-19 and the cut of some supply chains that led to high prices? Is it Ukraine? What's your picture? Okay. Let's start with some big picture numbers. Yep. So the European Union has 190 gigawatts of wind farms today, okay? And that is producing 15% of all of the electricity we consume in Europe today. 15, one five. 15, one five, yeah. Solar PV is then another 6%. So variable renewables are now over 20% of all of the electricity we consume in Europe, okay? So we have 190 gigawatts of wind farms, most of them onshore still, although the offshore is growing. By 2030, the EU now wants us to have 510 gigawatts of that's, wind farms. That's huge growth, yeah? Wow, wow. that's more than doubling. Oh yeah, far more than doubling. It's more than doubling. Yeah, from 190 to 510 in just eight years. Yeah. Okay. Is that doable? It is doable, yes, provided three things happen. Number one, we simplify the permitting rules and permitting procedures for building new wind farms, yeah? It goes too long, it's, it's, oh, it takes it's too, too long. long. Too slow, too much bureaucracy. The good news is governments understand this and they're working very hard now with the strong support of the European Union to simplify the permitting processes. The second thing we have to do is invest more in electricity grids. We need to double how much we're investing every year in transmission and distribution grids, especially those cross-border interconnectors, interconnectors in the power grid between different countries. You see, the wind is always blowing somewhere in Europe and you've got to be able to carry it, you know, from where it's blowing to where the energy is needed. The third thing that needs to happen is that we take care of the wind energy supply chain. So the supply chain is struggling today. We've got these 250 factories that I mentioned. We have five large wind turbine manufacturers based in Europe, but today they are all operating at a loss because of the higher steel prices, mm -hmm. higher prices of other commodities that we use because of inflation, because of bottlenecks in our supply chains. Yeah, and also because the market is not big enough because of the permitting bottlenecks mm. that we have. We're not actually building enough wind farms yes. today. Let's yeah? talk a little bit about the permitting. Yeah. Because um, there are, I, I know Bavaria quite yeah. well in Germany. <clears throat> and Bavaria <throat> says, oh, you cannot build wind farms if you don't keep a long distance to. In Hungary, yeah. it's even worse. Yeah. Uh, distance to uh, villages, to houses. Um, and I have heard that the government of in, Bav in Bavaria yeah. will now be faced with an idea of the federal government yes. which says you have to build percentage, I think it's 2% right. of the space you have to build until 2030. If you don't do that, you need to go down with these distances. It, that's what I've heard. And this is accelerating the permitting uh, of your business, correct? Indeed. So the long-term goal in Germany is that 2% of German territory should be for onshore wind. Today, we have 60 gigawatts of onshore wind farms in Germany, and they occupy about 0.5% of German territory today. So yeah, Four times as much. So four times as much territory. That's right. Yeah. That's and the German government is now negotiating with the 16 Bundesländer. Okay, what is your respective percentage of your territory going to be? And different Bundesländer will have different numbers. Yeah, and it may well not be 2% in Bavaria. Bavaria, as you say, doesn't have many wind farms today. Yeah, but they are changing their rules okay. in Bavaria to make it easier to build. So you see an improvement and possibly the whole discussion that we have in Brussels, repower you, we'll come back to that, yeah, yeah. helped a lot. Oh, very much so, yeah. Governments know that we need more renewables, we need to accelerate the rate at which we're building new wind and solar. And we need to do that in parallel with getting out of Russian energy imports, of course. This is the repower EU agenda. But they also know that you will only accelerate the build out of renewables if you simplify the permitting. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think, uh, 
I got it. And yeah. Our audience got it. So permitting is, is one big issue. And yeah. we try to help also from our side, from Hydrogen Europe. Indeed you do. Uh, Thank you for that. Yeah there, there, yeah. there are people who are very much interested in hydrogen in general. Yeah. And then we explain them in order to have more hydrogen, we need more wind. So we would need faster permitting. Uh, got it. Now let's tackle this uh, value chain, these problems that we have there. What can yeah. we do? Um, one idea or one question. We talked about steel. We talked about the high steel prices. We also see that these weeks, uh, the European Parliament and the Council are talking about CBAM, the Carbon Border mm -hmm. Adjustment Mechanism. Mm -hmm. It makes imported steel yeah. more expensive yeah. if it does not, if, if it has still high CO2 emissions. So if yeah. the uh, production method is uh, CO2 uh, intense. Uh, here for hydrogen, there's something in it because if we go for low CO2 steel, we need both electric uh, um, electric energy, electric arc, yeah, and we need hydrogen to um, reduce the oxygen in the iron ore. I'm not going to technicalities, but all the steel companies know that they have this yeah. path to go. Could we have a deal here? <laughs> because you need you need more windmills. Uh, we would have as a prime customer this industry, the steel industry. And if there is, let's call it a target or a quota for wind turbines with reduced, by hydrogen reduced iron or steel, yeah, that would be good for us. We anyhow have our targets, but we need to connect it to concrete business. Would that be something you could talk about? Well, I think there's a deal here in the making, and we're working on this already, Jorgo, not just between yourselves in the hydrogen industry and ourselves in the wind industry, but between both of us and the European steel industry. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Because I think the, the steel makers, most of them are, are, are members and some of them yeah. are also your members. Yeah, indeed. Um, they also understand, yes, we have this target now. The target is um, formulated at Repower U saying that 75% of hydrogen used in the industry yeah. until 2030 needs yeah. to be renewably produced, Indeed. 75%. Yes. That's a lot. So yeah. we need a lot of renewable hydrogen. Therefore, we need a lot of wind turbines. But if these wind turbines would be the, the best customer, the first customer, this makes the market. It kicks off the market. So deal. It's it, good. Absolutely. And part of the deal, of course, is to have green steel made in Europe. I think that's the most important thing. And yeah. the, the steel makers... Again, our members also have some doubts sometimes about this mechanism, CBAM, Carbon Border Adjustment, because they say, we are losing, we are losing world market shares. I always say it's the opposite, because we can, I don't like the word, but it's easy to understand, we can protect, so to say, our market from bad steel, from dirty steel, by concentrating on clean steel. And this is how we, how we can start it. One day, the whole world will have clean steel, but somebody needs to start. Yeah. And this is the mechanism. So you would support also this part of fit, fit for 55 CBAM. Indeed. You have to be careful with the small print in the carbon border adjustment mechanism. So to give one example, yeah. steel is covered, okay? Which means, you know, new duties on steel coming into Europe from countries that don't match Europe's ambition on climate change. Okay, what happens if you are a manufacturer of steel towers for wind turbines in Europe. Suddenly your input costs go up because some of your steel imports from certain countries will be more expensive, okay? So it's important then that the steel towers should also be covered by the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Because if you increase the costs for the European steel tower manufacturers that we use in the wind turbines, you run the risk of the Chinese yeah. steel tower manufacturers saying, oh, well, our costs are not going up. Absolutely. Yeah, we yeah, will absolutely. sell in Europe. I think this is an excellent point uh, also to discuss a new mechanism that came from the wind industry and now will be introduced also in hydrogen. It's the, it's the uh, contract for difference, the yeah, carbon indeed. contract for difference. Yeah. So maybe you can explain a little bit how this works in the wind industry. Yeah. However, for these... Um, factories that produce towers, it will be possible to get the extra price that they will have using this hydrogen treated steel by state aid yeah. via this carbon contract for difference. It comes from wind. It so does. Can you explain a little bit how it worked and how it helped to yeah. make you grow? 
Indeed. So when wind energy started, wind farms were expensive. Of course, things are when you start. The costs have come down hugely now. But when we started, we needed subsidies. So what governments did was they said, OK, if you build a wind farm, we will pay you a fixed price, and it's quite a generous price, for all of the electricity that you produce in those wind farms. And that price was higher in most cases than the otherwise prevailing market price of electricity. Yeah, but we needed those subsidies to get us going, get us off the ground. OK, if you build a new wind farm today in Europe, you don't get those subsidies anymore because we don't need them because our costs have come down. OK, but what we still need are revenue stabilization mechanisms rather than subsidies. And the way it works is this. Governments run auctions, OK, and they say, right, bid into this auction, wind industry, for the right to build these wind farms. Yep. Uh, wherever you want to build them or in certain defined areas. And it's a reverse auction, so the lowest price wins. Now imagine you bid into the auction. It's an offshore wind auction. And you say, right, I want to build an offshore wind farm in this zone of the North Sea, um, and I can generate electricity at 50 euros a megawatt hour from this wind farm. Somebody just needs to guarantee me that revenue. You're the lowest bidder in that auction, so you win, so you build your wind farm, and you are guaranteed 50 euros for every megawatt hour that you produce for the first 15 years of that wind farm. Okay. And it's 15 years because that's how long it takes us to amortize a wind farm, to pay off the, the bank loans we've had to buy the turbines when we built the wind farm. Okay. Now, the deal is we're actually selling electricity into the market, right? If we're selling electricity at 40 euros, because that's the prevailing market price, the government will then give us another 10 mm -hmm. to make it up to the 50 euros, which was the promise when we bid into the auction. Okay. Okay. If the market price is 60, we sell at 60, but we give 10 back to you give the it government. Back. So no profit. No. Well, you don't take the extra profit. No, no, no. Because the deal between the wind farm and the government is, the 50. is 50. And okay. it's always 50. If it's 70, we pay 20 back mm. to the government. Okay. Okay. Um, That's the way it works. That's a contract for difference. Now, the good thing about these contract for differences are two good things. One, they're pretty cheap for governments because governments are paying out some of the time, but they're getting paid back mm. a lot of the time as well. And today, with the very high wholesale prices, in fact, governments are getting paid back a lot of money by wind farms today. That's interesting to see yeah. how it, how it uh, functions. Indeed. The second advantage of these contracts for difference, Jorgo, is that when you build a wind farm, you've got to borrow a lot of money because you've got to pay for your turbines up front. There's a lot of project development costs, a lot of upfront capital expenditure that you've got to sink before you're producing any electricity and earning any revenue. Okay. Okay. That's right. So controlling and minimizing your capital costs is absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be borrowing money at very high rates of interest. You want to be borrowing at low rates of interest. Correct. Yeah. If you get this wrong, then your financing costs become the single largest component of the total lifetime cost of the wind farm. And the lifetime cost of that wind farm go up significantly. So you've got to control your financing costs. And with the contracts for difference, you can do that. It's bankable. It's it becomes bankable. bankable. You go to the bank, you say, look, I've got to buy all these turbines to build my wind farm, mm -hmm. but I can promise you that the government, whichever government it is, is going to pay me 50 euros a megawatt hour for the first 15 years. Bank looks at it and is very happy. So this system worked for some years now, for how many it, years? It is working now for about, we're touching 10 years. 10 years? Now. And it will continue to work. Oh, it's, it's the standard model now, cool. certainly for offshore wind and increasingly for onshore wind. That's very more good. and more governments are using this. And the European Union, the European Commission is actively promoting this system. That's the good thing yeah, about yeah, yeah. it. Because yeah. the system will now also be introduced in, in the hydrogen sector. Indeed. So um, That's right. uh, let's talk a little bit about Repower EU. So yeah. the big plan that has been introduced by the European Commission after the invasion of Russia into Ukraine. So I think uh, uh, already uh, beginning of March, there was That's a right. first draft, yeah. which now has been adopted 18th of May Indeed. Uh, by the commission. And it's fairly supported also by the 
member states. Yes. So they support this. And I think the important thing here is that wind is profiting from Repower EU because, I mean, basically we need to replace fossil and Russian, both. And Repower EU does exactly that. So it it, it is good for wind uh, because the targets, I think, have been uh, set up. But it's also good for hydrogen. Let's talk about Yorgo, the- you've used a certain language here, yes. which I'm going to nuance. Wind is being given even greater responsibilities as a result of Repower like it. EU. It's, it's a better language. And so is hydrogen. Very good. I, I learned from this. I like yeah. it. So wind, solar, yeah. so all the renewables and hydro are giving greater responsibility. I like it. Thanks. We'll use it, this mm-hmm. nuance. Good. Can we talk shortly about the wind aspect in Repower before sure. we go to some aspects of wind and hydrogen? Yeah. So Repower EU, what's, uh, what's in it for wind, for the wind industry? So the European Commission has said that we've got to build an additional 60 gigawatts of new wind farms by 2030, over and above the targets that were in the EU scenarios before Russia invaded Ukraine, yeah. okay? 60. Which means we've got to get from these 190 gigawatts we have today to 510 by 2030. Those are the numbers, right? That's okay. good. So yeah. we, we know the numbers. So just to compare to, to our numbers, yes, <laughs> we uh, in Repower, you have the responsibility to produce 20 million tons of green hy- hydrogen. So green means renewably produced hydrogen. Yes. Um, and 10 of which uh, should be produced in Europe. Indeed. In the, the other, European Union. In the European Union. Okay. Correct. Yes. Correct. Yes. Uh, you said already you're from Birmingham. So <laughs> <laughs> you're looking at this issue very, very yeah. um, precisely. And the other 10 million tons will be imported. Yes. Um, just to give an idea of what that means. We need electrolyzers yes. to produce all this. Yeah. Uh, we have at the moment globally an electrolyzer capacity of round about three giga. That's yeah. already uh, a lot. And we need, in order to produce 20 million tons, 300 gigawatt of electrolyzer capacity. So it's a factor of 100 yes. within eight years. Yeah. It's, that's quite challenging, Giles, and we need, <laughs> we need your support uh, in order to give the support back. Yeah. Um, but here we need to talk how we can ramp this up and how we can um, also take care of the renewable production of imported wind, uh, or imported hydrogen via wind. Is that something you're looking into right now? Uh, because um, let's talk about Morocco or let's talk about UK, this is also imported wind uh, out of the EU perspective, unfortunately, I have to say, but let's not go back uh, to this. Uh, also, Norway, that's imported. Is there a perspective also for your industry to say, okay, um, if the European Union now comes up with um, schemes to support imported hydrogen, there's something in it for us as as the wind industry? So let's take your 10 plus 10 yeah. numbers, yeah? 10 million tons yeah. of renewable hydrogen made in the EU, 10 million tons imported into the EU from outside yeah. the EU. Those are the commission's targets for 2030. In the wind industry, we want as much as possible of the renewable hydrogen that is going to be consumed in Europe to be made in Europe from electrolysis in Europe and to be made from renewable electricity in produced Europe. in Europe. I agree. Yeah. Uh, so I, I agree fully uh, because this creates jobs here. Yes. And this is this is very important. Yeah. We have done our calculations and we, we understand that, um, first of all, the permitting has to accelerate. We talked about that. Yes. That's one precondition. Yeah. But also, um, we need to go offshore. Huh? We need to go much, sure. much, much more offshore. Mm-hmm. Um, this is another precondition. However, there still is a need to use the wind energies that you have. Let's stay with Morocco. Oh, Morocco, there, there you have a lot of Atlantic wind. Um, so if, if we say, let's set up some European parks in Morocco, you wouldn't say no. Look, I mean, one has to be open-minded about these things and Morocco is on the doorstep of the European Union. There's another country we must keep firmly in mind here. That's blue and yellow. uh, Which is the blue and yellow. Absolutely. Ukraine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, There will be most probably, and we are sure about that, a recovery plan for Ukraine to be uh, started day one after the war. Yeah. 
uh, we as Hajin Europe are preparing for that. So yeah. we would like to see something like an agency taking care of the European Green Deal, including lots of wind, of course. Mm -hmm. I personally have seen from friends of mine in Ukraine destroyed wind turbines. Indeed, that is I've, true. I've seen these yes. pictures. Yep. It's really shocking. It I mean, is indeed. It's, it's a tragedy what happens to Ukrainians, yes. to people. Yeah. But it's also unbelievable that the Russians yeah. attack. Yeah, these the have not been destroyed accidentally. It's not accidentally. No. So um, do you have an idea about this recovery in Ukraine? Are you discussing that in the wind industry? So wind energy was growing rapidly in Ukraine. The geographical potential is great. Wind speeds are very good. Lots of space. Yep. Um, they had over one gigawatt of onshore wind farms already. Okay. Lots of plans to build many more. Okay. Um, there's demand for renewable electricity in Ukraine, and there's demand also for renewable hydrogen there. And there's interest in Ukraine in exporting renewable hydrogen yeah. to, to other countries. Yeah. So as and when we're able to start focusing on recovery, there's great potential there. Uh, you mentioned exporting hydrogen because there are these pipelines, existing pipelines, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of redundant pipelines also that can be used uh, for in, in, in Ukraine produced hydrogen to be exported to Slovakia, Hungary, mm -hmm. uh, Romania, Poland. So there are four pipelines even. Uh, and um, so that is something I just want to inform our audience yeah. we are working on. And there we want, uh, I can say as a hydrogen sector, the hydrogen council in Ukraine is quite actively involved. We, are the, uh, we have another hydrogen association. So we have two yes. hydrogen associations in, in Ukraine. And uh, we would like to uh, involve uh, you, of course, as soon as possible. Uh, The hydrogen sector already uh, starts by training people from Ukraine in, in, in the hydrogen sector. Yeah. So they will work with our joint undertaking. Yes. Uh, and we are fully collaborating here in order to, well, to create something like a nucleus of this agency. And uh, if we will need uh, wind expertise, I think we, yeah. we, we will. Very happy together. to work with you on this. That's, that's very good. Yeah. Um, Perspective. Mm -hmm. We talked about Repower EU. We talked about the challenges that we have uh, in order to ramp this up. Mm. What's your gut feeling? Uh, we now have got the wind by the commission and by the member states. What could hamper all this? What do we need more um, in order to be faster? What's your take? Okay, we are optimistic about Repower EU because we see, as you say, the political winds are there. Governments want to deliver the energy transition. They want to change where energy comes from. They know they have to do that. And it's not just about fighting climate change, it's about energy security now, and it's about jobs. You see this all over Europe. Take Germany. Germany used to build about four or five gigawatts of new wind farms most years on a steady basis. And then that went down about five years ago, went down to about one and a half gigawatts a year because they were having problems with permitting, right? New German government came in last year. Very clear. We've got to do something about this. They want to build 10 gigawatts a year of new wind farms from 2025 Whoa. onwards. And they are taking major steps to simplify their permitting rules and procedures. And they're introducing this new principle of the expansion of renewables being a matter of overriding public interest. And Repower EU reflects this and is going to put this same principle into EU law today, which will have a very powerful effect. Yeah, I, I'm with you. Uh, I also think uh, we are also positive and yeah. optimists yeah. Uh, about it. Um, I'm very happy about this mm, pro-renewable, but also pro-hydrogen cause of this new German government. Yeah. You need these governments. I mean, uh, we have also seen in France big announcements on, on hydrogen. Uh, yeah. President Macron, when he Indeed. started the EU presidency, uh, in the end... <laughs> the proof of the pudding is in, yeah. in the eating. So we need to see all this implemented. But yeah. we are ready, you are ready. I think uh, it could give also new impulse uh, to your industry because indeed uh, for some five years now that there, there, there is the problem. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm very confident here. 
What about jobs? I mean, you talked about you talked about the jobs that you have created already all over the years. Do you see a potential for jobs in combination with hydrogen that would not exist? Would there not be hydrogen? Let's talk a little bit about talk about the marriage of wind and, and hydrogen. Why is it so important? And is there a potential to create new jobs? Before I answer that specific question, Yorgo, you asked a moment ago, what are our nagging concerns yeah, about yeah. Repower EU? And I just want to answer that with yeah. two points. And the first, in fact, is jobs. It's not so much jobs as human skills. resources and skills. skills. Yeah. yeah. We I don't have them. Got it. Today. Yeah. For any sector that's in clean energy. So we have 300,000 people working in wind. That's growing to 450,000 by 2030. But we're struggling to find those extra people with the right skills. Governments have got to invest more okay. in vocational skills, in engineering. They've got to work proactively to encourage, motivate young people to come and work in clean energy and to develop technical and engineering skills. That's the first thing. Second thing, we've got to look after our supply chain. I said earlier, supply chain is operating at a loss today mm -hmm. in wind energy for a variety of factors that I have explained. And governments have got to engage proactively to ensure we have a sustainable, viable and competitive wind energy supply chain in Europe. That means rewarding the added value of the European wind energy supply chain in the auctions that governments run. It means helping the European wind energy to reshore some of the components and materials that today we are importing from China and other places outside of Europe. Yeah, things like the permanent magnets, the gear boxes, uh, the glass fiber fabrics that go into our wind turbines. Yeah, so the EU is putting a lot of money into expanding microchip manufacturing in Europe because it's a strategic industry. We don't want to be dependent on on imports from a selected number of countries. We should do the same with renewable energy manufacturing as well. These are strategic industries. Absolutely. We, we call them hydrogen renewables, so hydrogen and renewables yeah. already in, in one set. And I share what you said about skilling. I think yeah. this is uh, very, very important to understand we need more people. We will create more jobs and we will yeah. see more jobs. We will see that these hydrogen renewables, based on renewables, of course, will become strategic. Yeah. You cannot replace Russian gas, oil, etc. If if you don't regard this as a strategic issue. And that 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 is something we, we do together. Um, let's round up by talking about something else. So skills is scarce, are scarce, but also uh, rare earths and, and some yeah. raw materials. Do you have a strategy uh, how to tackle this? Because we, we need, we also have this issue. Uh, so uh, the, the hydrogen sector also relies on certain rare earths, precious metals. Yeah, indeed. Um, do you have a strategy that we could possibly also go together, support you? So wind turbines, many of them have inside them two rare earth elements, neodymium and dysprosium. And they are part of the permanent magnets that we have in a lot of wind turbines, okay? Today, we are importing permanent magnets from China with the neodymium and dysprosium already built into them. The European Commission has said that by 2030, they want 60% of all of the permanent magnets used in wind turbines to be made in Europe from zero today. And the rare earths, where do we find them? Uh, this is something we're discussing with the European okay. Commission. Very yeah, good. Yeah, Very yeah. good. Yeah. So we need a joint strategy here because it's Absolutely. In, in, in our joint interest uh, to run this together. That's right. We are both members of the EU's Raw Materials Alliance, of course, okay. uh, Jorgo. Now, you wanted to talk about where wind meets hydrogen. That's exactly yes. the case. Yeah. Let's look at the numbers here. Okay. So today, all of the energy that is consumed in Europe, amazingly, only 25% of it is electricity. Yeah. A lot of people will be surprised by that. You think, well, you know, lights and all the electricity we consume, that's most of our energy, isn't it? No, there's another 75%, which is the petrol we put in our cars, the gas we uh, have in our boilers to heat Still our some coal. homes. Yes, there's the 
fossil fuels that go into our airplanes and, and ships and so on. So we've got to increase that 25% number that's electricity in the energy mix today. And the plan is it should be 75% by 2050. And that 75% then breaks down 57%, which is electricity to power electric vehicles, electric heating, uh, electrified industrial processes, but another 18% on top of the 57%, which is all about hydrogen. And this is where wind meets hydrogen, okay? So wind, according to the EU, will be one half of all of the electricity we consume in Europe by 2050. Well, yeah, that's one half, up from 15% that it is today, from 15 to 50%. To 50%. Yeah. It's big okay. figures. Big numbers. Um, yeah. Big numbers. And I, I think where wind meets hydrogen is uh, to balance grids out, to, to help Uh, to balance it and also to use it then directly. Well, uh, there are two things. It's it's us giving you wind power for you to electrolyze absolutely. to create renewable hydrogen for which there is demand and there's going to be increasing there be, demand in industry yeah, there will be and elsewhere. This 18% of the energy mix that has got to be met from renewable hydrogen, basically, sourced from renewable electricity. Yeah, in, okay. Then, and you've touched on this, just as the storage... Okay, the more variable renewables we have in the electricity system, more storage we need. And by 2050, it's going to be 50% wind and, you know, up to 30% solar PV. Yeah, you're going to need more energy storage to balance the variable yes. renewables. And you'll need short term storage, which is all about batteries. And you'll need long term storage, which is where hydro pump storage and hydrogen. Comes yes, exactly. In yeah. um, I, I showed you some pictures that we made. Yes. Uh, where we also test uh, salt caverns. At the moment, we are doing it with nitrogen. You test it in order to see, is there a leakage? Can hydrogen be stored here? You do it with nitrogen because it's much less uh, dangerous. And then uh, you can store hydrogen. Exactly. And uh, Giles, I think that's a very, very good mm, pair, uh, this uh, wind and, and hydrogen. Um, and um, all over these years that we are working here in, in Brussels, uh, I think we have done quite well huh, to make this case also together and uh, to um, make not only politicians, policymakers, but even our members sometimes understand, because I have to admit, a, a lot of information advocacy is not channeled to policymakers, but also to our own members to yep. understand other sectors a little bit better. Indeed. And in the end... It's a win-win situation for, for all of us. Absolutely. Thank you. You have the last word. Well, can we I say, I think the best thing, Jorga, is that this is actually happening today already. Our industry and your industry are working together already on projects that are going to be operating some of them by the end of next year. Let me give you two examples. Northwest Germany, there's some onshore wind farms near Lingen in Nordrhein-Westfalen. Yeah. The electricity is going to be electrolyzed, okay? There are some pipelines, existing pipelines that can be converted to carry the renewable hydrogen, 130 kilometers. That hydrogen will then be taken south to the Ruhr. Where I'm born. Sorry, yeah. Lingen is in Niedersachsen, not Nordrhein-Westfalen. Forgive my to... mistake. You were very polite in not correcting me. Yes, yeah. The, the demand... The, the industrial consumption of this renewable hydrogen from the onshore wind will, of course, be in Nordrhein-Westfalen, in the Ruhr. In the Ruhr area. Yeah, that's right. There's and there's a BP refinery which will use it, and there's an Evonik chemical works which will be using it. And that's a fantastic example, and this will start operating next year. Then It's called Get H2. Uh, this project is get, called Get, get H2. H2 Nucleus is the name of the project. Then you have Aquaventus, also in Germany. This is using offshore Absolutely. Wind, of course, yeah. And the plan there is to actually do the electrolysis out at sea in the offshore wind that's, farm. That will create new jobs. Uh, and uh, this is fantastic to do um, offshore electrolysis and to use then the pipelines, yeah. which exist. Huh? We have a dense system in the North Sea of pipelines yeah. that you can use. And Indeed. So um, that helps also building up the, the electricity grid. Yeah. Huh? So you, you balance things out. You use existing infrastructure. I think there's a lot of potential for uh, this future that starts already now mm -hmm. for both. 
Wind indeed, and indeed. And then in the Netherlands, you have all of those projects that are moving forward rapidly in the northern part of the country. Of course, there's a certain urgency there because the Groningen and gas fields yeah, uh, are coming to the end of their life. And there's huge industrial demand Absolutely. in the northernmost part of the Netherlands. Absolutely. And they want offshore wind. They want it converted into hydrogen. Absolutely. And uh, also in the south of the Netherlands. Yes, south indeed. Right now. So the projects, yeah. Netherlands is, a, yeah. like Denmark, are yeah. role models indeed. also for other countries. Uh, indeed. To, There's to a lot really happening in Spain as well, of course. Portugal. Yes, indeed. Not to forget yeah. Portugal. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, this is something that we will see now in the next years to come. Yes. Let's work together. Absolutely. Uh, we launch a video, a small little video after this podcast yes. uh, together, showing the potential of both industries working together and creating even more jobs. Yeah. Um, and that's good for us and for our children. No? We have children Indeed. we want to do something for. Yes, quite. Yes, yeah. Giles, thanks very, very good. much. Thank you, Jorgo. Thanks for joining us and we will continue that. Hydrogen, Great pleasure. first element. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.